to introduce our guest of honor. Thank you. And please, please sit down. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Secretary Albert Del Sario, Excellencies of the Diplomatic Corps, His Excellency Ivo Saibel, Ambassador of uh, Switzerland to the Philippines, of course, His Excellency Toshinao Orabe, Ambassador of Japan, His Excellency Guy Le Du, Head of the Delegation of the European Union, Secretary Voltaire Desmin, Members of the Cabinet present, Senator Lauren Legarda, Honorable Cristalina Giorgiva, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Miss, <laughs> thank you. Miss Margarita Wallstrom, Honorable Wang Van Trang, Assistant Secretary Maria Siraida Angara Collinson, Asian Europe Meeting Partners, Delegates from the International and Regional Organizations, International Humanitarian Assistance Organizations, the private sector, non government organizations, and the academe. Participants of the ASEM Manila Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction and Management, fellow workers of government, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, again, a very pleasant good morning. Any brief review of the headlines and reported weather patterns of the past few years would reveal, reveal a startling trend. Tragedies caused by climate change have not only become more frequent, they have also become more devastating and larger in scale. More and more, the stories we encounter in the news are becoming all too familiar. Countries hit by storms of historical magnitude, people losing their homes, their livelihoods, and everything they work for, often even mourning the loss of their loved ones. Just recently, we witnessed some of these scenes during the flooding in the Balkan regions, which I am told was a result of the heaviest rainfall in the region in 120 years. I could not help but be reminded of the tragedy of Typhoon Haiyan, or Yolanda as we call it which took the lives of thousands of my countrymen and affected millions more. But we also realize that the impact of climate change goes beyond the threat of weather disturbances as we know them. For some island countries like Kiribati in the Central Pacific Ocean, climate change has become a threat to their very survival. If water levels continue to rise at the same rate, in time, their country will be completely consumed by the ocean. It leads me to ask, what did their citizens ever do to deserve the prospect of being the first batch of climate refugees? On a broader scale, developing countries such as mine, despite having an almost insignificant carbon footprint, are disproportionately vulnerable to hazards such as Typhoon Haiyan. What did the thousands who perished and the millions affected by that super typhoon do to deserve such a fate? Is it not incumbent upon all of us to address the problem of climate change as one global community in the soonest possible time? This is why we are here today, because we all agree that we cannot sit idly by as the effects of climate change worsen. It is vital, now more than ever, that we mount a focused international effort to address the threats posed by climate change and to build communities that are resilient in the face of disaster. It has become increasingly necessary for us to convene and to share best practices and by so doing evolve as one international community in addressing this common problem of ours. In this regard, I believe my country has some very meaningful lessons to share. In fact, during the most recent World Economic Forum held in Manila, the Honorable Kyung Wakang the United Nations Assistant Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Deputy Emergency Relief Coordinator had this to say about my country, and I quote, we always talked about the Philippines as being one of the best prepared countries in the world when it comes to natural disasters, because there's so much of it. The Yolanda experience will be talked about for many years to come, both in this region and for us, because there are many good lessons, close quote. Perhaps you will allow me to share some of those lessons today. Our country historically welcomes around 20 storms a year, but more recently, we have noticed that these storms have not only become more powerful, they have also begun shifting tracks, hitting areas that are not normally frequented by typhoons. In the last 20 years, we have observed an increase in the number of typhoons entering our Visayas and Mindanao regions. These regions have also seen the most powerful typhoons in recent years, Typhoon Washi in 2011, Typhoon Bofa in 2012, and Typhoon Haiyan in 2013. This is precisely why, instead of simply being reactive, 
our administration has always taken a proactive approach to reducing the risks posed by natural calamities. From day one, we undertook the large-scale enhancement of our scientific capabilities. We acquired and strategically positioned Doppler radars that enable us to better estimate the amount of rainfall brought about by incoming cyclones. We launched a project called NOAA, or the Nationwide Operational Assessment of Hazards, which involved integrating the early warning systems along 18 major river basins, installing hundreds of so-called hydromet devices across the archipelago, and putting up a website that enabled anyone with an internet connection to access real-time weather information. Through LiDAR technology, we likewise began mapping the topography of our floodplains and river basins. We also prepared multi-hazard maps that identify areas that are prone to flooding, landslides, tsunamis, among other calamities. Of course, these efforts go hand in hand with training our personnel working with the local communities in the use and maintenance of these new technologies. We are also finding ways to make it easier for all Filipinos to act on the information made available to them. From previously just measuring wind strength alone to determine the intensity of storms, we now measure rain strength as well. We also make it a point to translate this information through an easy to understand color scheme, which coupled with our hazard maps tells our people in the simplest possible terms the anticipated severity of the weather disturbances. After all, how many of us can really visualize the effects of floods solely by seeing the estimated amount of millimeters of rainfall? These, among other initiatives, demonstrated our resolve to maximize the impact of technology on improving the resilience of our communities. On top of this, our administration also made the habit of anticipating needs. The duty of government at the bottom line is to serve its people to the fullest of its capabilities. And given such disturbances, government must do everything in its power to reduce the people's suffering to the bare minimum. For this reason, we carefully studied the projected paths of every incoming storm and pre-positioned assets, whether they were relief goods, medicine, personnel, aircraft, ships, or other equipment, in safe and nearby locations so that help can arrive to affect areas in the quickest possible time. Typhoon Haiyan, however, was unlike anything we had previously encountered. Some experts say that it was the most powerful storm to make landfall in recorded history. It certainly felt that way. Haiyan swept away many of the relief goods we had stockpiled. It affected millions of our countrymen, including some of the first responders who were supposed to give initial assistance to those affected. Several of our airports, roads, and ports were rendered unusable. Communications and power went down. At that point, it seemed like every development compounded the problem further. On top of this, our resources at that point were already stretched quite thin. As the super typhoon came on the heels of several other natural and man-made disasters, including a group of lawless elements laying siege to the city of Sambuanga, the earthquake in Bohol, and Typhoon Nari, all of which occurred less than three months before Haiyan. Despite the circumstances, our government, together with the Filipino people, persevered. We were able to clear the airport in Tacloban, which was one of the most damaged areas within the first day of the relief efforts, which was the day after Typhoon Haiyan struck. And three C-130 aircraft were able to land, bringing with them personnel, relief goods, and a communications van to help restore communications. After that, we continued to work quickly and tirelessly to clear all the paths to restore the lines of communication, to gather and deliver enough relief goods, and to engage our international partners, all with the goal of alleviating the suffering of all those affected in the soonest possible time. Eventually, through the assistance of thousands of volunteers, as well as that of friends and partners around the globe, we were able to help bring the affected communities back on their own two feet and are now helping them tread the path to recovery. Our collective efforts did not go unnoticed. In fact, the World Bank Country Director for the Philippines, the Honorable Motuo, Motuo Konishi, told us that the way we handled Typhoon Haiyan, and I quote, set a new standard on how to shrink the time between the disaster hitting, relief work being carried out, moving on to early recovery, and then to reconstruction, close quote and that they wanted to conduct a more in-depth study of our response. Regardless, Haiyan was a harsh reminder. The new normal brought about by climate change is not only here to stay, 
its effects are worsening at an alarming pace. We realized then that despite the initiatives we had undertaken, we had to do even more to reduce climate change risks and that our nation alone could not do this by itself. With this in mind, we are fully integrating principles on climate change adaptation so that they influence decision-making in every aspect of governance and encouraging other nations towards realizing this end. Essentially, we are trying to climate-proof our path to progress. This is the very idea that has driven our efforts to build back better. We refuse to be condemned to a vicious cycle of destruction and reconstruction. As we rebuild our homes, roads, and our communities, we must remain acutely aware of the reality of climate change, and we must equip ourselves with the wherewithal to withstand future calamities. For instance, this is exactly why our Department of Public Works and Highways has come up with new designs for disaster-resilient roads. We have also looked to simple, creative methods of problem solving. For example, we have found that there is a method of bending corrugated GI sheets over the eaves, through which one can make the roofing sheets more resistant to the lifting power of strong winds. We have also received help from our friends in the international community, not just financially, but in the form of ideas. Our friends from Japan, for instance, have already shared their knowledge with us on how to construct buildings that can serve as natural water catchments. Indeed, overcoming the challenge posed by climate risk is enormous. It requires cooperation on every level, whether it is among citizens, among local governments, or among nations. Typhoons, after all, do not pay heed to national borders. They threaten all our peoples. Each of us is a stakeholder in this endeavor, which is why this gathering is of absolute importance. We must take advantage of every opportunity we have to share our experiences, ideas, and technologies, whose value is not measured just by any form of currency, but by the number of lives saved. It is thus both heartening and empowering to see that we are all eager to work more closely with one another, with the knowledge that disaster resilience has become an, an irreplaceable prerequisite to building a truly progressive community. I am extremely hopeful that all of you will maximize your time here by sharing your thoughts and listening to the thought of others. I do not think anyone here can argue with the thought I want to leave you with. The reality of climate change is already significantly altering the way all of us live. And we are now faced with a crucial choice. We can either act collectively now to address the problem, or we can choose to act independently or not at all and suffer the aftermath of inaction, inaction collectively. Regardless of the choice we make, one thing is certain, we will reap the consequences together. This is why I encourage all of you, please let us continue working together through forums such as this one and let us deepen our cooperation to give rise to a world that is safer and more resilient. This is our only planet and it is our duty as its citizens to do everything in our power, not just to protect it, but to improve it and make it better than it ever has been. I thank all of you and I bid you all a good day. Thank you very much, Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen.